Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here, and thanks very much to Vida and Christina for including ourselves from Hype here again, because I know it's, it really is uh, very important for us and for the whole sepsis programme that we work very closely together. And I was delighted to hear Mitch speaking so much about coding, because uh, I know it can sometimes be a, a sort of a niche place to be, but um, we do use an Australian classification, so we, it is a bit more responsive and uh, slightly more flexible than the, what's used in the US. But I have a very brief presentation today, and I could talk, as you know, those who know me, for a, the day on coding and hype and classifications. But I am happy to do that with anybody at lunchtime who wants to. So I'm just going to do a very quick preamble, really, into Gráinne's uh, presentation on the report. And what I really wanted to do was to talk about hype very briefly, very much an overview, you know, what we do, where it comes from, etc. So I suppose recognise sepsis is really the, you know, hashtag rec recognise sepsis. It's so important, you know, Neve spoke and Mitch spoke about all the different aspects of the, that it has to be, you know, recognising it in the patient, that it's recognisable in the, the documentation, and then it's, you know, we can then report on it, and it's, you know, we can report on these, these really good statistics that we have here today to be reported on. So I think that, you know, we're talking about recognising it across the, the different systems, the, the from, right through from the patient right through to, to the data. Hype data can collect a principal diagnosis and up to 29 additional diagnoses, and we also have a hospital acquired diagnosis, and I know Anne's question earlier would have referred to that. We also collect procedures as well, but today we're just talking about those diagnoses. And I suppose what's really important for us in reporting sepsis to have it available for these, you know, reports and benchmarks and for, for um, looking at the risk models, the clinician must provide all that information on the patient's diagnosis and treatment and date it with a signature. And this is what the coder needs in the chart. The hype coder then will translate that information to a coded uh, format to reflect that patient's hospital stay. And very importantly, I suppose, causality cannot be inferred as sepsis may be one of many diagnoses that complicated the patient's admission. Mortality rates are reported are sepsis associated and not necessarily directly due to sepsis. And I will have some examples to show you as um, I just run through the, the few slides here. Sepsis is most likely going to be an additional diagnosis in, our, um, in, in the hype data. The overall weighting of a case's complexity is affected by the addition of those additional diagnoses. So it is very important that if a patient does have complicating comorbidities that they are recorded in the uh, chart documentation so that the coder can pick those up. And it really does affect um, you know, the, the complexity of a case as reported through to the system. The weighting, just a note, is unaffected by the position as an additional code. It doesn't matter how high up in the string of codes it is, but as long as it is present there, that it is available to be reported as a, a complicating comorbidity. This is just an example to show you what a string of codes, or what a patient, if, if you don't mind me saying, what a patient looks like from the hype side, from a coding side. So this patient here has um, leukemia. That's their principal diagnosis is leukemia. And you can see that they have sepsis, they have SIRS with acute organ failure, or OR651 code. And you can also see that they've acute kidney failure, they've a history of allergy to penicillin, which will be a factor. Uh, mention of tobacco use and palliative care. So I suppose that's what it looks like from our side. That's how we translate that into those codes that, that, that Mitch was talking about. And it is a challenge often to um, be sure that the, the, the coded data are as correct as possible. This is a slightly bigger, a longer case. I know you can't read it there particularly, but I just wanted to show you, as I said, we can collect up to 30 diagnoses. So there's, there is huge capacity within HYPE to collect these, these data. So we are um, reliant on them being correctly uh, documented in the charts, um, that the, you know, as I say, that it is recognized within the chart, that, the, that it's clearly there and available. And the coders then will pick up. So you can see that, I mean, we collect about 1.7 million hype records a year. So it's, it's a fairly formidable task for the coders to be collecting the detail of information they do. And their job is certainly made a lot easier with clear documentation so that we are sure that we are collecting all of the information. And I just, I just um, circled the OR651 as that would be the code of interest to this audience. Um, just to finish off, we had a national audit of hype data by an Australian 
company, the Pavilion Report. Many of you will be familiar with that. It was a good result for Hype Data um, on a review of our data. Uh, room for improvement, as um, we all have room for improvement. One of the main recommendations was to increase clinician involvement, and that's really been, you know, the sepsis programme has, has really helped us with that. I mean, we've really... You know, we've been present at this conference every year. We're very much part of the, the work um, of the programme and out in the hospitals. And um, that's, it, this is a really good example of that clinician involvement for us. Um, we train in the Healthcare Pricing Office, the HPO, we train the coders and we also monitor the quality of the data. There's extensive training. We have the DIT certification course. So these are really well-trained, uh, educated, hype coders that are collecting these data for the, the system. And we also obviously have multiple tools available for quality assurance and review. And I suppose that's just, it was an international review and we're constantly educating and reviewing the data. So I just wanted to assure you of the, the quality of our hype data. Just to reiterate the source documentation, clearly um, be clear and detailed, accurate and complete information all diagnosis, comorbidities and procedures, as I said to you, we can collect up to 30. And as you can see from those couple of examples, coders really do their best to collect as much as possible to identify that patient's episode of care at that time. And sepsis must be documented and or that sepsis form signed. So finally, just to uh, reiterate on our collaboration, we've held six national workshops. I'd say 99% of coders in the co country have attended that. I would say of all specialties, or if you can call sepsis a specialty, I'm not sure, you, you know, but of all diagnoses that we deal with, I, I think it's the one most uh, foremost in coders' minds as they would all have received training in it. And we had some um, fantastic workshops with uh, Vida facilitated for us. We've link, links forged at the hospitals and at national level with the, the hospital sepsis teams, with the group sepsis ADONs, and with the national team. So it it's really is a collaborative effort for us, and it's a really important area. And as I said, we're delighted to be present here. And many of my colleagues that work in the coding in the healthcare pricing office are here. And we're very happy to speak to anybody who'd like us to come along and speak to you about hype or the coding, or the, the challenges of coding. And just to finish with the first slide that I had before handing over to Gronia, reporting sepsis really is teamwork, you know, from identifying with, recognising it in the patient, identifying it in that chart documentation, and then coding it to have it present in that report. So I'm going to hand you over to Gronia now, who's going to bring you through the report. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, so my name is Gronia and I'm a statistician in the Quality Improvement Division and I've been working with Vida and Christina and the Sepsis Programme and with Deirdre and her colleagues in the HPO on the analysis of data for the National Sepsis Report. So as Deirdre mentioned, she's been talking about hype data, so most of the analysis in the report is based on hype data. So we've looked at inpatients aged 16 and over in public hospitals. So we've excluded day case activity. For most of the tables and charts in the report, we excluded maternity and paediatric cases. And it refers to patients discharged from public hospitals only, so we don't have information on private hospital activity. And we looked at patients with the diagnosis of sepsis, and within that, though, we mean series of infectious origin without acute organ failure, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. So one of the key findings from the sepsis report in 2016 is that there was a 67% increase in the number of documented cases of sepsis. So in 2016 there you can see that there were 14,804 inpatients with a diagnosis of sepsis. There was already an upward trend between 2011 and 2015 and in total now since 2011 the number of sepsis, documented sepsis cases has increased by more than 100%. So one of the key findings then from the 2016 date is our mortality rate. So in 2016, of those patients, there were 2,735 deaths. And this equates to a mortality rate of 18.5%. So that's not to say that, age, that sepsis was the cause of death in those cases, but rather it is that in 2016, of patients who had a diagnosis of sepsis at some point during their episode of care, 18.5% of, of them die during that episode of care. Now, if we want to look at the trend over time, well, we need to make sure that there aren't differences in age profiles that are affecting our analysis. So to account for this, we age standardised the data. 
Now you can see there that the difference in the 2016 figure is actually quite slight. So it's 18.3%. And this is a 19% reduction in our mortality rate compared to 2015. And again, we are on a downward trend. And in total, since 20, 2011, our mortality rate has decreased by over 30%. If we look now at the characteristics of inpatients with the diagnosis of sepsis in 2016, as you'd expect, the numbers increase with age. So the age group there with the highest number of cases is the 75 to 84 year olds. And in total, 44% of patients in 2016 with sepsis were aged 75 and over. And this is really important to note in the context of an aging population. So the mortality rate rises then with age groups. So as you can see there, the patients aged 16 to 24 had the lowest mortality rate in 2016, and the patients aged 85 and over had the highest. And if we take the group of patients aged 75 and over, they had an overall rate, mortality rate of 25.8%. And if you remember, this compares to our national mortality rate of 18.3%, or 185 unadjusted for age in 2016. You'll notice in this chart as well that I've included patients aged 0 to 15. So just for completeness, we have looked at maternity activity and pediatric activity. We found that there were no deaths among maternity patients with sepsis in 2016. And of the pediatric cases, there were a small number of deaths and it equated to around 3%. So Mitch and Deirdre have already mentioned the differences in the encoding. So we're fortunate that we use the eighth edition of the ICD-10 AM classification. So it's the eighth edition Australian modification of ICD-10. And in this classification, there are specific codes for SERS of infectious origin without acute organ failure, several different codes there for sepsis, and a code for severe sepsis with organ failure and septic shock. So you can see there that there are relatively small numbers of cases of patients with SERS and septic shock. What's really interesting is how the, the mortality rate varies among patients with these diagnoses. So if we start the first category there is series of infectious origin without acute organ failure. And these patients in 2016 had a mortality rate of 8.1%. And it rises then to a mortality rate of over 30% for patients with severe sepsis and 41.4% for patients with septic shock. Now, if we, look, if we were to look at the new sepsis-3 definitions and take out those patients with series of infectious origin, we found that our mortality rate in 2016 was 19%. Now, we know that sepsis is very linked to a number of comorbidities, and these can affect the mortality rate. So we looked at selected comorbidities, and we found that Patients with a diagnosis of diabetes, cancer, COPD, they all had a higher mortality rate than patients without these comorbidities. But what's particularly noticeable about this is that patients with chronic kidney disease and chronic liver disease, in addition to sepsis, had an extremely high mortality rate in 2016. So for patients in 2016 with sepsis and chronic liver disease, in 2016 they had a mortality rate of 37%. There's a cumulative effect to the comorbidities as well. So as the number of comorbidities increases, the mortality rate increases. So for patients who had none of those comorbidities in 2016, they had a mortality rate of 15%. But for patients with three or more of those, their mortality rate was more than double. It was over 30%. In order to look, at our, to look at the change over time and see what the variation is like, we looked at our data in a statistical process control chart. So this shows the quarterly mortality rate since 2011. And what you can see from this is that there's a seasonal variation in sepsis mortality rates. It typically peaks during quarter one and the winter, the winter months, which is likely to be related to the increase in respiratory illnesses during that time of year. You can also see there at the end of the chart in quarter two, three, and four in 2016, the, the crude mortality rates were below the lower control limit. Now, if nothing had changed, we'd expect all data points to be within the control limit. So this provides us with a signal that there is an improvement in our mortality rate. So just to talk a little bit then about sepsis in the context of overall inpatient activity in 2016. 
So as I mentioned, there were 14,804 inpatients with a diagnosis of sepsis. And this is around 3.4% of total inpatient activity, based on the, say, the same criteria as an excluding maternity and excluding um, children aged under 16. Of the 2,735 deaths, these account then for almost a quarter of total hospital deaths. And again, that's not to say that a quarter of hospital deaths were resulted from sepsis, but rather it is that in 2016, of all hospital deaths, a quarter of them were in patients who had a diagnosis of sepsis at some point during that episode of care. The average length of stay for sepsis is quite long in comparison to our overall national average length of stay. It was 20.5 days in 2016. And this compares to less than five days for patients who don't have sepsis or don't have an infection. Now this, however, is an improvement or a decrease on the 2015 figure, which I think was almost 25 days. And in total in 2016, patients with, with sepsis accounted for over 300,000 bed days, around 10% of total inpatient bed days. And again, it's not to say that 10% of bed days were caused by sepsis, but rather that they were occupied by patients who at some point had sepsis during that episode of care. So to summarise then, we've had a 67% increase in 2016 in the number of document, documented cases. And this is no doubt related to the tremendous work of VEDA and the sepsis programme and the HPO in improving the recognition, coding and documentation of sepsis. Our in-hospital mortality rate was 18.5% and this is a 19% decrease on 2015. And if we exclude series of infectious origin without acute organ failure and look at our sepsis 3 in-hospital mortality rate, it was 19%. And we know that mortality rate rises with age and with comorbidities. So thank you very much to lis for listening to both Deirdre and myself, and we'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat>
I think it ha I mean, we've seen increases in the number of cases across all of those different categories. And um, probably the greatest increase has been in the lower acuity patients, so the serous of infectious origin and sepsis. Um, but I think we did see more reductions in mortality rates across all of them. And just to add to that, that we, we excluded those low acuity patients without organ uh, failure in our sepsis three um, mortality rate of 19%. And I think that allows us to benchmark internationally. So while we can't comment how much of it is improved care in terms of the mortality reduction, what we can say is our absolute number of 19% is very encouraging and suggests that we're performing as well as other uh, countries with robust sepsis quality improvement programs. Uh, thank you very much to um, Deirdre and uh, Gronje for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure you'll agree with me that... Uh